Hello out there YouTubers and welcome to P.E. Slick Podcast. I'm your host Matt here. Each week I'm going to bring you something different in terms of leadership, ministering, entertainment, book authoring, and much more. But before we begin each time, I'm going to be airing a classic throwback commercial from back in the 80s or 90s or 2000s for my personal liking. Stay tuned. Of course I killed them. I just aimed, shot, and killed those little creeps myself. New faster killing black flag ant and roach killer kills with an exterminator proven ingredient. Their kind deserve to die. Black flag. And we're back. It's your host, Ranger Matt here. Joining me this week is Mr. Randy Cartwright. Randy worked at Disney. He animated a lot of characters on a lot of Disney movies and some other films that were not a part of Disney, and I'm, I'm glad that you took the time to be a part of my podcast, and I'm I'm just happy to be talking with you. How you doing, Randy? <laughs> oh, I'm doing fine. Uh, fun to be here. Yeah. How, what's the weather like out in California right now? It's a little cool right now. <laughs> yeah, Los Angeles gets gets pretty hot at times, but it's a little cold right now, a little chilly. Yeah. Not, not snow chilly, <laughs> but chilly. Yeah. Okay, yeah, and the weather here in uh, Maryland is okay, too. It's a little warm today, but, you know, it's not one too bad today. <laughs> okay, uh, to get things started with, uh, where are you from? Uh, well, originally I was raised in Fullerton, which is uh, a town about six miles from Disneyland uh, here in the L.A. area in Orange County. Uh, and um, I was actually, well, actually, I was originally uh, born in uh, Newport News, Virginia, and lived in Maryland when I was <laughs> wow. little. When I, yeah, until I was three. <laughs> my, my parents worked for NASA, which was now, no, NACA which is now NASA, NASA, because <laughs> it was the uh, National Aeronautics something at that time yeah. before the space program. But, yeah, they, they worked there and, and lived in uh, Hampton for a while. Okay. Um, I, you know, you, you said you came from here. You said we're not related somehow? <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe we are. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, go back. Go back to Jamestown. Maybe we have some connections over there. Yeah, I have some family on my grandfather's side. That's from uh, Richmond, Virginia. Oh, yeah. My mom's from uh, Suffolk, Virginia. My uncle lives in Richmond. So. Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, what kind of hobby did you have growing up? Well, uh, my main hobby was animation. When I was 12 years old, in sixth grade, I, I discovered flip books. A little friend did a flip book on the corner of his notepad. I was that's really cool. I went out that night and bought some little pads of paper and started filling them up with little bombs and airplanes flying by and things like that and kind of immediately fell in love with it and realized this is what I want to do with the rest of my life. Right. So I started buying more pads of paper and filling them up with, uh, with little bits of animation. I probably did a hundred of them over the years. And uh, then when my family got an 8-millimeter movie camera, I started making, you know, taking my little toys and animating them around. I had a little uh, flexible Gumby and made some little Gumby films. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. And, yeah. And, uh, yeah. So, so my main hobby was, like, making movies and animation when I was a kid. Okay. Which is what I wanted, wanted to do ever since I was small. Yeah. Did you, did you have a favorite Disney movie? Uh, actually, uh, I, I really liked Alice in Wonderland and Sword in the Stone. Uh, Alice in Wonderland, because it was so weird and I loved uh, the colors. Sword in the Stone, probably because it came out right about the time that I fell in love with animation. So it was uh, the first one I saw when I knew what I was, began to realize what I was looking at was what I could do as a living. So yeah, uh, it was like that one. This question might be a little less ill, but you know, you you was around around the town when Walt Disney was alive. Um, any insight about what you were doing or where you was at the time when the news broke that he had passed away? Well, yeah, well, yeah, that devastated us all. We were everybody was shocked. It was just horrifying. But actually, 
a couple of years before that, uh, my family had, had gone out to the Disneyland Hotel for dinner, and we just finished. It was me, my parents, and my little brother. I was like, uh, see, he was probably like six, and I was like uh, 10, 12, 11 or 12. And um, we finished dinner, and we we're walking around the uh, shopping arcade. It was completely empty because all the stores were closed. So my little six year old brother was like running as fast as he could down this empty hallway, and he turned a corner and bumped right into Walt Disney. Wow. Almost knocked him down. <laughs> Walt was walking around there all by himself. And my parents apologized, and he laughed and said it was okay, and he said hello to me. <laughs> and, um, yeah, I was just, my, could, don't think I said anything back. I was too shocked. <laughs> but, but he seemed like, uh, he seemed exactly like the nice guy you saw on TV every Sunday night. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, you know, I know, I know some of the, uh, the animators that worked on it, worked with him, of course, for, from many years back. And I guess in his work environment, he wasn't that really nice guy. He was a pretty hard nosed boss. He really was particular about what he wanted. Kind of scared everybody a little bit, but um, when I met him, he seemed really nice. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sure that was a an interesting uh, trivia moment there because you know you met him and then years later you worked at his his company was a part of the yep, movie. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Um. So we did talk about your hobbies within animation, but uh, when 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 exactly did you get into animation? Um. You went to Cal Arts, correct? Uh, no, I didn't. UCLA. Um, well, what happened was I was, of course, making my films and in, in uh, high school, started ma trying to make little films, a couple live-action films, and uh, so I started an animated film. I had got an idea for a little film called Room and Board and started animating it in high school. I continued to animate it all through college, and I, I went five years with college, uh, and finally finished it at uh, UCLA. I started out at Cal State Fullerton, which was nearby, and then I fi finished it at UCLA. So it took five years overall to do this animated film. Uh, but that was um, a, a complete film, and, and it was put in several um, uh, film festivals, and I won some awards for it for that. And... Um, at the time, actually, I was I was working at Disneyland before the studio. Oh, because uh, yeah, I lived nearby, like you know, a few miles away. Right. And I happened to get, get in the Christmas parade, and then I got a job as a Disney character. <laughs> I was one of the costume characters. I was uh, I was uh, a pig for a while, and I was a uh, Dopey and uh, Prince John. Several different things for a few years. Right. Well, while I was while I was working at Disneyland, my film had been out at various festivals, being shown around, and I was working uh, at Disneyland. I had been working on a portfolio of uh, drawings to take to Disney at some point, but I hadn't taken it to them at that point. Uh, and all of a sudden, one of the supervisors came over to me and said, "Oh, your mother's on the line. She says it's an emergency." So I rushed to the phone and I called, and she says. The Disney Studio just called. We want to talk to you. Huh? <laughs> and I, I found out that one of the uh, artists there had seen my film in a film festival and come back and told the studio about it. And so they found out from UCLA my home address and phone number and so called me and asked if I had a portfolio and asked me to bring it in. So just out of the blue... <laughs> Disney asked me to bring in a portfolio, so that was a a big moment, <laughs> you oh, might imagine. Oh, absolutely. You know, I mean, that, that's a one-in-a-chance shot right there. I mean, yeah, you know, yeah. 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 yeah um, but when, when I took in the portfolio, um, uh, I took it to Eric Larson, who is one of Disney's nine old men, the nine key animators. That right. With. He, he was running the training program. It was, had just started a few years before. A training program for to train new uh, Disney animators, and he looked at my portfolio and said, uh, "I'm not going to submit this to the review board uh, because you need to work on your drawing." But he sat down with all of my drawings. He need to work on this and work on that. And gave me some little sketches to show what kind of stuff I needed to concentrate on. And so I went back and did another portfolio, 
came back a while later with it. He said, okay, that's better. Now, work on this and that and this and that. And I, each time, he'd go over and tell me what to work on, what to concentrate on, and kind of tutor me through my portfolio. And it actually took me seven portfolios over a period of a year before he finally submitted it to the review board. Right. But but it was really, you know, kind of amazing. But then, yeah, then finally they, they accepted it, and I got in as a beginning trainee. Okay. Uh, did you meet any of the other nine old men, Frank Alley, Ward, Luke, Paul? Oh, yeah. I, I, I've met all of them. I, I worked under Ollie on uh, rescuers. I was uh, just before me. Glenn Keane was a, a, a trainee that came in like a year before me. Mm-hmm. And he had been Ollie's in-betweener on the rescuers. Uh, and then he moved up to full animator. And I was, I guess, next in line. So Ollie asked for me, and I got to be Ollie's in-betweener on Penny on the original rescuers. Uh, and then when Fox and Hound started up, Ollie asked me to kind of uh, take over his assignments. Because he, he and Frank Thomas, the two, two key animators, were going to retire. Uh, and he had been working on some uh, the dogs on Fox and Hound. And he brought me in and kind of worked with me for a while and handed that assignment over to me to finish up <laughs> on the film. Right. Uh, and, uh, yeah, so I knew them. I, I, uh, so I worked with Frank. I knew Frank and Ollie fairly well, worked with Ollie directly. Um, and so I met Ward Kimball once. A bunch of us went over to his house because he was known to be kind of a renegade, and uh, we were real depressed at that. It was during the, we were making the Black Cauldron, because years later. Yeah. Uh, and Black Cauldron was kind of depressed, and we didn't like the way it was going. Uh, and so we went to Ward to see if he would give us some advice to cheer us up, because he'd gone through some bad times, too. Right. So we went over there, and he said, oh, I don't know what I can tell you guys, but uh, come look at this. He took us to his backyard and showed us his, his train that he had. He had a full steam locomotive in his backyard. Right. And then he had a, had a huge room filled with toy trains and, and toys from, like, 1910 that he collected when he was a kid. And so he gave us a big tour of his whole house, uh, which – cheered us up, didn't tell us much about how to deal with the Black Cauldron, but it was a lot of fun to have <laughs> show all this stuff to us. Yeah. yeah. I'm sure it was cool, though, I mean, because I know him and Walt had the same interest in training, so Walt had a training set as, as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah Walt had, had one. So did Ollie. Yeah. Ollie and War- Ward had a full-sized locomotive. Ollie had a miniature one that he made himself that ran around his backyard. And Walt did the same thing that Ollie did, saw Ollie's and made a, a bigger one, a bigger train track around his house with a miniature train he'd ride around on parties. Right. Uh, oh, oh, Ollie said he would, whenever Walt would have a party, he'd always invite Ollie to come to his party at his house. Uh, and then he put Ollie in the control panel, control room for the train uh, tracks. And so he'd set to sit there the whole party and sit there and just switch the train tracks for the different people riding on it. He never <laughs> got to participate in the party at all. Yeah. What year did you join Disney exactly? Uh, 1975, uh, back in the past century. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so when you joined, um, Ron Miller was running the studio, correct? Yes, he was. What was it like working with Ron Miller? Walt Sunderland. Oh, oh, actually, Ron was a uh, a nice guy. He was not real tough. Um, actually, as he got for a head of a studio, I think he was probably too easygoing because a lot of things just didn't have the you know the drive behind them. A lot of the movies of the time they were kind of real easygoing movies. Right. Uh, but he was. He always had his. Uh, Office is open. If anybody had anything to talk about, come up and talk with them at any time. Uh, and, uh, so yeah, he was a, you know, a nice guy. Uh, just probably not what you really need as the head of a studio, but, you know, mm-hmm. he, he was, in, uh, he, he okayed the training program to keep the animation going. The reason they started the training program was they knew that, uh, 
you know, Frank, Ollie, Milt, and uh, John Lansbury, all the key animators were getting old. They were going to be retire in a few years. And they were thinking, okay, what happens to animation after we retire? Does it just disappear? And they decided, were thinking, well, maybe we could bring in some new young people and see if they can do it. And most of them decided, nah, we don't, Walt's not around anymore. There's no way you could uh, train anybody anymore to do this kind of stuff. But he said, well, let's try. Uh, Eric, uh, Eric Larson was one who said, well, let's, let's try. Why not try? Couldn't hurt. So he said, oh, okay. <laughs> they started, I think the first one they brought in was uh, Don Bluth. Uh, he was the first trainee. Right. And uh, then they started and they found it was successful and they brought in more people, more people. I, was, I think I was something like the 15th or 16th person they brought in. And uh, that actually... At the time, animation was not a career anybody thought about. There was no animation in schools except for UCLA and, and USC. Uh, there were no animation departments because all you had was these kind of crappy Hanna-Barbera Saturday morning things going on. And, right. Uh, it was kind of a dying field. Everybody that I talked with that had any connection with the animation business said, don't go into animation. It's going to die. I see you're going to just have a terrible life. Don't do it. Uh, but, you know, I, I had to do it. I had no, I just, it's what I needed to do, so I decided I'd do it. Right. You know, no matter what. So, <laughs> I did, and uh, it turned out to be this, this huge thing that we have now, where there's animation all over the world. Just about every school in the country have animation departments. I mean, there's schools all over. Uh, they're, you know, thousands of people in animation, all the TV stuff, the Cartoon Network, and Nickelodeon, and, you know, there's just tons of animation going on all over the world now. Right. They were like, for the Academy, I think they had to review, what, 32 features or something like that this year? Animated features were submitted. Uh, I mean, it's a huge uh, industry now, animation. Right. And it all kind of started from this little Disney training program when animation was ready to die. <laughs> yeah, and it might have, I mean, I guess for some point it might have seemed like that at that, that time um, in the 70s, I know Disney was making a lot of live action movies, and they had yep. made uh, The Rescuers, Robin Hood, and The Aristocats. And mm -hmm. um, so when you came, um, The Rescuers was being made, right? Was that your first movie? Yes. Uh, actually, my first week there, uh, I was walking down the hallway, and John Lounsbury, who was also another one of the nine old men, saw me and said, hey, you're new here, aren't you? Said, yeah, yeah. Hey, want to come up and see the film? Oh, yeah, sure. They had they were running a pencil test, a rough uh, pencil test of story reel of the film. It was in the middle of being product, uh, production, and periodically... They just review all the material they have to see the film in the state that it's in. And so I went up there, and I saw the rescuers in the room where none of the other young guys were there. It was just Frank Thomas, uh, uh, Wooly Reitherman, the director, uh, John Lansbury, Ollie Johnson, Milt Cotton, I mean, all, all the, the key Disney people that were had worked with Walt Disney. That was the whole room <laughs> filled watching that thing and me. Right. I got to watch the whole thing with them. Oh, my God, it was amazing. Right. Uh, and the end of the film, which was, it's a big chase in the final film of animals and, and things in the swamp, uh, had not been animated. So they just had a bunch of gray leader and some guitar music playing in the background for that whole, for the amount of time that that sequence would take place. Yeah, that was actually one of my favorite movies growing up, The Rescuers. Oh, yeah, well, great. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of hard to pick, like, my favorite one, but I did, that's, like, one of my variety ones. That and uh, they did a sequel, The Rest of Down Under. Yep, yeah. Yeah. Now, when you was there, um, one of the things that I loved the most about uh, Waking Sleeping Beauty, you had some footage from that time. Oh, yeah, yeah. That was done because I... I just bought a brand new sound eight millimeter movie camera and I wanted to try it out. Uh, so I decided, oh, I'll just take it into the studio and film some stuff, see how it works out, and, you know, just 
to test out, test it out. That was the reason I did that. <laughs> and uh, John Lasseter was, he was actually my assistant at the time on Fox and the Hound. He had just, just come out of, uh, graduated from Cal Arts. And um, uh, so he he, decided, he agreed to just to be the film, uh, the, the camera, and hold the camera. And so right. I went out there just to introduce the, uh, the film, walk around the studio and see what the studio was like. Uh, and as if you see in the film, Ron Miller walks out right at the beginning, which is a total shock. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no idea. I mean, it's and, like you're, you're you're filming, and then here come the boss. Like, uh oh. <laughs> yes, yes. And uh, and w- when you walk in to the, at the time when you walk in the Disney studio, right at the front of the the guard shack is a big sign of Mickey Mouse holding his hand up, saying, "No cameras, no photography." <laughs> is <laughs> what they say. So I say, "Eh, what the hell? I'll do it anyway." Right. Put my camera out. So I did, and. Um, it, I, I never thought it would be anything but a home movie, something we could look at every once in a while with some friends. Uh, and the, then Don Hahn, who did the the, uh, the Waking Sleeping Beauty documentary, I, he was there. I had one screening at the studio years ago after I made the film for everybody who was in it. And Don was there at that screening and remembered it and gave me a call and said, hey, did you sell that film? Yeah, I got it. Do you want to? Can I use it in my documentary? Yeah, sure. So I let him use it, and now it's kind of part of Disney history, which is <laughs> kind, of, kind of neat. I yeah, don't expect that at all. Absolutely, because you. I mean, you know, who? I mean, who knew that years later, you know, looking back, you know, that would be a big part of of the outcome of what happened back then. Because a lot of people you have, um, some of them is kind of still around, some have passed away, yeah. some of them has retired, yeah. and you, I mean, and a lot of y'all were younger, I mean, not them calling mm-hmm. you old, <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> it, it, it was it was a good symbol that, you know, you, you did that. Um, yeah. That that actually inspired me to take a turn. Um, I, I took uh, it, um, one of my cameras, and when I was in class, I would film um, people setting up camera shots, and when they were... Uh, and that folk, I took a lot of photography classes, and that you you doing that and me seeing that kind of gave me the inspiration to do that. And I recently shown yeah. some behind the scenes footage of how the shots were set up and people I haven't seen in a long time. That that was a good consideration yeah. from you doing that. <laughs> Great. Well, I'm glad I can inspire you. Yeah, it's, I wish I had done more because these productions, they you know. They, the management doesn't want anybody to take any footage, afraid they'll be used to, to you know, knock the studio down or something. And, right. But there's so many things I wish I'd been able to take more now. At the time, it just seemed like everyday stuff. You know, you saw it every day, you saw these people every day. It was no big deal. Right. Uh, and I didn't really know how historical it would be. Don said that at, during that period, there was almost no – footage at all of people working at the studio, and he couldn't have made that documentary if he hadn't had that footage to kind of tie it down. So, I'm yeah. glad I did that. Yeah, because at, at that time, I mean, years later it happened, but at that time, when they released the movie, I mean, of course, it was before DVDs, it was videos and technology, yeah. of course, and back then, they would play the movie, but they didn't show, like, the nigga of the movie or any photographs of you guys until like the 90s on Disney Channel and yeah. on video. That all came later, so having footage like that is a big welcome. Um, I know majority of the footage is on Waking Sleep and Beauty because I've seen it, but is there plans to put that all that out on YouTube at any, at any time or on your website? Um, no official plans yet. I'm, I'm uh, a little nervous. Some people have told me that if I just put it out there and may have people complaining about rights or something so I don't know if uh, I can put the whole thing out right away uh, so I, I'd like to there, there are actually three films I made one 19, uh, 1980 was the first one right. then I made one in 1983 which was my last day at Disney because I had a uh, I worked a couple of years in Japan on Little Nemo and Slumberland and so I left Disney to, to do that just because the opportunity to live in Japan was so, you know, amazing to be able to do that. <laughs> so I, I I did that. But I, I took one of my very last days, 
And then I took one in 1990 uh, to the to the day, uh, ten years to the day from the first one. Right. I did. They were working on rescuers down under for that. Yeah, I, I, I've got to try to find where I can get those out, or, or let Disney maybe do some with the the rights and put them on online somewhere. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that would be. I think that would be cool. You know, because I'm sure there was a lot more footage that wasn't seen or, like, something that you could see that wasn't, you know, narrated over top, you know. Um, yep. That, that, that yeah, was, each one was 20 minutes. Yeah. 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 So it, 60 minutes overall. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. What was it like working on the Fox and the Hound? Oh, well, that was that was interesting. I, I, you know, I learned a lot. That was That was kind of our training ground for a lot of us, really learning how to really do things. Uh, for us, the Fox and Hound, the, the story and characters and all, were we were not terribly excited about. It was kind of a woolly film. Like, Willie Reiserman was kind of, he liked kind of country style and kind of corny humor and things. For us, we were really looking forward to The Black Cauldron. That was going to be the picture after, and that was going to be supposed to be run by the young people, the young staff. It was going to be the first movie really controlled by the young people and the potential of it seemed great really fantastic with the, the environment and the characters were were really rich personalities and we were all looking for, considered fox and hound to be our training ground and then the black cauldron was going to be the one where we really showed what we can really do right uh but what happened was during Fox and Hound, Don Bluth left, took a whole bunch of animators with him. Right. Uh, and it scared the studio. Uh, so they were scared to trust any young people for a, <laughs> after that. They, uh, they actually gave us all raises to try to get us to stay. We were afraid more of us were going to leave. But then instead of having young people running the, uh, the Black Cauldron, they put in these older animators that had been kind of second rank animators their whole career. They'd never been supervisors before, but because they'd been there for a long time, the studio kind of decided they would trust them. And so they got Black Cauldron and uh, they didn't know how to control, how, how to do a story. They didn't know how to work with the staff. They were, uh, an example is the, for the for the character designs, uh, Andreas was Andreas Deja was uh, a new, brand new animator who just come there, but he drew really well and had a lot of ideas. So we had him come up with all kinds of ideas, character designs of all different styles for the main characters on Black Cauldron. We had a whole wall, whole hallway filled with his sketches. He did tons of sketches of all these ideas, were really cool ideas from characters. Uh, when the new, the old guys came in as directors, they said, well, let's see what Milt Call could do. Milt was retired in, uh, in San Francisco, and he didn't want to work on anything anymore. He was done with animation. But uh, they called him and said they pay him a tremendous amount of money if he come up with designs for the characters. And so he spent, you know, probably a couple hours doing some sketches, did like one sketch of each character, he didn't really think about it much at all. They were just kind of standard formula designs. He sent them in. The directors saw them and said, okay, we've got our designs now. And that was <laughs> it. It was the designs. Right. Were, because Milt had done them. And they were just, you know, they were not inventive at all. There was nothing. You know, as you can see, they're just kind of milk toast, middle-of-the-road designs for characters. And so anyway, it was a depressing time. You the picture we were so excited about just kind of being turned into something we were not happy about at all. Right, and I had read that um, cause there's an article about when Don had, Blue had had left and formed his own studio, and that Fox and the Hound was originally called, came out in 1980, but was pushed back mm -hmm. to 81. And actually, a part of that was come was another question I was going to ask um, when you joined in '75, um, kind of asking the terms of what was the atmosphere like. I know some people said um, Don Hunter and, and Wake to See Them Do, that animation was kind of like a stepchild because 
you know, it, it, a lot of movies weren't made in animation, a lot of live action, even though they did, you know, as I mentioned, Arista, Robin, Rescuers, King mm-hmm. Dragon was live action in animation, Boxing the Hound. Yeah. And people were saying, um, what would Walt have done? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah there's a lot of that. Um, and in in terms of movies, like I said, there wasn't much animation being done anywhere. Uh and actually, Aristocats and Robin Hood were not Disney's best movies. They really lacked uh, Walt Disney's input. They, to do a story without Walt's input, kind of, they kind of fell flat in certain areas. Uh, and yeah, animation was in the movie industry was not considered much of anything because right. the only movies, you know, there was. They made a, they made some money, but not really a lot. They didn't have a bit huge audience. Uh, you get a, and of course the the movies hadn't been at the beginning. The movies had not been released on video at all. They didn't even have commercial videos when I first started. Uh, videotapes were just brand new, and they considered them something that people would shoot their own home movies on. It was like eight millimeter film. Uh, and yeah, it. it it was not, uh, there was no prestige really right. uh, in in being part of the animation team at the time, but uh, we didn't care. It was, uh, everybody that was there was there because we loved animation and we wanted to do it. Uh, and it was a very loose time. Like Ron Miller, like I say, was not real strict. So we could wander around the whole back lot anytime, wandering to watch them filming movies. I watched a lot of, uh, Freaky Friday being film. On my breaks, I'd go over to the sound stage and watch Jodie Foster filming uh, Freaky Friday. She was 13 years old at the time. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it was, it was fun. We'd wander around. We'd, we'd goof around. We'd climb in the sound stages when there was nobody, when they were empty. We'd go and climb up these catwalks, you know, like five stories above. A terribly dangerous thing to do, but uh, and nowadays, they would not let anybody there unless you're you know, a licensed electrician. Right. But, uh, but yeah, no, we went, we, we go up there, we climb to these catwalks, and then we take these super balls and drop them off and see if we can catch them as they bounce back up. <laughs> Five story, uh, catwalks. Uh, but, um, you know, it was, it was, it was really a great place to, to grow up. It kind of still feels like home to me when I visit. Cause, uh, it was just, I don't know. We were doing what we wanted to do. Right. Which was, working on anim- animation and doing what at times at least the best in the world at the time so a great place to learn yeah it, it really seemed like it was a great place to be at and a lot of y'all was very energetic and and happy pulling jokes in there um the one guy who i didn't really know not much about and so i knew a few things but not a lot about him but he worked at disney and had a lot of energy and we can see them duty was joe Rams. Oh, Joe was great. Yeah, Joe was very funny. Just a, a completely off the wall sense of humor, but constantly humor. Always a good mood. He he was actually the nicest person I've ever known. I got to know him, you know, pretty well. And uh, in uh, when I worked, I worked on Brave Little Toaster in Taiwan later and Joe went over with us there, Joe and his wife. And uh so yeah, he, he was he's this great big huge guy, a big bear of a guy, but the nicest, sweetest person. Uh a few years ago, you know, he he uh died in a car accident. Yeah. Boy did that uh that was dep- it's still depressing today. Right. I think Joe's not around. Um, what led to you leaving Disney in 1983? Oh, uh, that was because I got an offer to work in Japan. And first I said, no, uh, I'm not going to leave Disney. But they said, okay, well, if you come over for a couple of weeks, we'll pay for the vacation. And you can spend one week talking with our animators and then one week to just tour around Japan. Well, I'm not going to pass that up, a great opportunity for a free vacation. Right. So I did that and uh, gave some lectures on animation to the animators and then toured. And by the time I was done, I decided, wow, I have an opportunity to live here in this culture. And uh, 
you know, it's just it, something doesn't happen a lot in your life. You get a chance to live in a completely different culture. So I went and talked to Disney afterwards, and they said they understood, and I'm welcome back any time, you know, but if I want to go and, you know, experience Japan for a while. So I did, and, yeah, it was great, and my wife's Japanese now. <laughs> I met her there. <laughs> oh, my. Maybe I need to take take a, a note from you and do that so I can find my wife. <laughs> yeah. Go to Japan. Um, yeah. But what's it like out there in Japan? And I know that was back then. But what was it like going to Japan from California? Oh, it was, it was, it's really, it's weird. Because <laughs> you have this ancient culture with this, you know, the paper and the, the wood and everything is so sophisticated and classy. And then you have Hello Kitty stuff right next to it. You know, just the most <laughs> crass, you know, commercial stuff. It, it's a great – I love that. It's just like a mix of uh, oh, a mix of great art and, and kitsch all together. Uh, but, and as a foreigner in Japan, uh, in Japanese culture, guests have a very high status. Uh, and so as a foreigner visiting – you're a guest, and so everybody treats you very nicely, very well. If you are standing in the street and you look like you don't know what you're doing, someone will always come up and try to help you, try to explain the maps to you, and you know, try to figure out where you're going. Uh, it, you know, it's, a, it's a really great experience to visit uh, visit Japan. Right. Uh, and I, I, on the movie, though, the movie itself turned out to be kind of stupid to work on because they, I, I was there for two years. And I started to train the animators, but they never got a story together. Every time they do a story, the producer would say, nah, it's not what I want. Have them redo it, redo it. And finally, after two years, I decided, eh, this is not going to work. So I finally left. So they just couldn't make their mind up on the story. So they never even started the film. Right. <laughs> yeah, it was great. It finally got done after that because the, the financing is coming from a company called Lake, which is a, a, a real estate company that's owned by the Yakuza, which is the Japanese mafia. Oh, and they were, putting, they were paying for the movie because they had a bad reputation and they wanted a cartoon character for their logo to try to lighten up their image. Uh, <laughs> so that's why they were paying for this movie, to have cartoon character logos. And so after I left, I heard the producer kept changing his mind on what he wanted on the story was told that he had to come out with the movie in by the next year or else he was going to be in the bottom of Tokyo Bay and so the movie was rushed out and was finished in, uh, by the next year right so okay um you also worked on Brave Little Toaster I know that was a project John Lasseter was trying to work on and Ed Henson yes. and Ron Miller wasn't really trying to do that but they eventually got that gone and it came out yeah it was uh originally john wanted it to be uh cg because it was you know objects which are the kind of thing cg could do the best at the time and it was going to be a, for the first computer animated movie uh so he was working on it but yeah they didn't uh the management just didn't want to do uh computer animated movies it was too new too bizarre they had done tron uh but um yeah they and they didn't like I, – I don't know exactly what happened. I wasn't there when he finally left. But, um, right. Yeah, and so the movie then was given to the Disney TV, and uh, nothing was done with it for a while. Then uh, the management came in. Michael Eisner and Jeffrey Katzenberg took over the studio. And um, J uh, Jeffrey Katzenberg looked at all the pictures and said, no, we're not going to do that. Throw that out. We don't want to do that. Well, one of the producers – had actually after that actually signed up a company to do Brave Little Toaster, and Jeffrey was furious. <laughs> the, the producer was fired, but he had the contract, so they went through and did the Brave Little Toaster. It was done for about three million dollars, which is like terribly low salary <laughs> uh, budget for the movie. Right. They didn't want to pay anything for it, but um, but I knew uh, Jerry, the director, and. Oh, and Joe Ramp, a good friend who had been working with John on the movie, and uh, a lot of really good people worked on it. And so our goal was to try to do the best movie we can under an absolutely nothing budget. 
And so that's how we came out with uh, Brave Little Toaster. It has, has a following. People still seem to know about it. So that, that was nice. Yeah, I I like Brave Little Toaster. Um, I actually fell in love more with the second and third one that came out when they went to Mars uh-huh. and then to the rescue with the animals. I thought, <laughs> yeah. I thought those two, those two was kind of the more of my, my favorites in the first one. I did like the first one, but I guess the, the second and third one had a little bit more adventurous to yeah. it. And um, the first one kind of had a little bit of a, I guess it to kind of put it the uh, dark side a little bit to it a little bit. It had some all the appliances uh, yeah. went through some dark moments. They even had the mm-hmm. the vacuum choking on the, his own core at one point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I thought it was cool that the man who did the voice of him was one of the singers for a lady in the tramp from um, Yeah. Uh, oh uh Thurl Ravenscroft. Yeah. 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 He also does uh, Tony the or did Tony the Tiger. Wow. It was great. That was uh, <laughs> Jim Kim. <laughs> mm, I didn't know that. Now I know that. Yeah, yeah. Um. So, what was it like when you, when you did come back to Disney? You came back in '86. Uh, what was the first film you worked on? Well, actually, uh, I after before I left Disney, I had uh, been uh, New Jerry Reese and Bill Croyer who would do the animators on Tron, and I kind of got a taste of computer animation for that. And I kind of thought, wow, this could be really something amazing in the future. And so I had, I bought myself a home uh, Atari computer and learned a little bit of computer programming. Right. And um, uh, so it be, kind of became a hobby uh, was computer programming. And uh, when I got back to Disney, I said, is there anything computer oriented I might be able to get involved in? Well, they were just beginning to design the CAPS ink and paint system, which was the digital paint, ink and paint system right. first used on uh, Rescuers Down Under, then Beauty and the Beast, Latin, and everything else. But so there was nothing like that. There was no Photoshop, nothing was available. And so they had to design everything from scratch. And th- so they asked if I wanted to do that. And I said, well, yeah, sure, why not? So I knew animation, I knew computers, so I could kind of be the person between the artists and the computer people. I can understand both languages. Uh, and so I became the artistic head of the CAP sink and paint system, which actually took four years to actually develop. Right. But um, I would I would tell the uh, computer guys uh, all the things we needed as, as artists. Uh, a lot of times they say, we can't do that. That's crazy. So, well, you, they wanted to do a real system, you have to do that, and so they actually buckled down and actually did all the things that I told them they had to do, and they got this system, and we found that, uh, that, that my, my goal was to make it something that the artist could use without any computer background, because nobody knew computers at the time, and we had it where uh, a, a painter who had been a traditional animation painter could sit down with the system and with a morning uh, training, by the afternoon could actually be doing production on the on a film. And these people had never touched a computer in their life, so I was real proud of getting a system that was easy enough to use. Right. And all, all the systems were designed after Disney systems, the terminology, everything. So it was something when they sat down, it was kind of felt familiar because a lot of the things were uh, Disney-oriented type system. Mm-hmm. So I did that, and but then I went. Um, when that, was, when that was finishing up, I decided to get back into animation. So I went on to Beauty and the Beast, and uh, which was just starting up, and asked if I could animate on Bell because I had hadn't been animating for a few years, and I really wanted to push myself. Uh, and human characters are very difficult to do, so I deliberately picked uh, Bell because I wanted to really, like I say, push myself to get back into animation. Right. And that's what I animated, a, you know, a lot of the scenes of, of uh, Bell under the direction of, uh, of uh, James Baxter, who's one of the best animators, still one of the best animators ever. Right. <laughs> did you by chance, from your time earlier at Disney, did you by chance meet and know um, Larry Clemens and Vance Gary? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I knew both of them. Yeah. Larry was doing, uh, Vance was doing storyboards on a lot of the movies, and uh, 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 Larry Clemens, he was an old uh, radio writer. He did co- uh, ra- 
used to write for the radio TV shows and then became the dialogue writer uh, for uh, all, uh, a lot of the pictures, Woolies pictures. When, when we used to make a movie back then, they didn't have a script the way we have now. Right. They had uh, just kind of picture outline of generally of what to do. So a storyboard artist would uh, board the, draw out the film plus write all the dialogue and invent the dialogue for all the scenes. And then they'd have a dialogue polish writer, which was Larry, who would come in and would rewrite a lot of the dialogue because it wasn't maybe it wasn't quite right for the character. The concept was okay, but the way the words were quite right, and he would reword re uh, write the dialogue to actually fit for the char- fit the characters better. So it was nowadays we have a full script and you pretty much stick to it. You have new ideas and things, but you can't. If his dialogue, you pretty much kind of have to use what's there with modifications. But, uh, yeah, you're really more, much more limited than we used to be back then. Right. Okay. Um, so around I, – I know you left in 83, but then um, – I know you came back. But around the time mm-hmm. later on, um, Michael Weisner from Paramount and Frank Wells from Warner's and Jeffrey from mm-hmm. Paramount – they all came to Disney to revamp it with Roy mm-hmm. Disney. Um, any intake on working with Michael Eisner and Frank Wells? I know Frank Wells passed in oh. 94. Yeah. Well, I, the only um, interaction I had with Frank Wells was uh, when we were doing caps, we had a demo uh, set up to show them what it was. Mm-hmm. And when we showed Michael Eisner and Jeffrey Katzenberg, they just kind of looked at it. Yeah, okay, that's good. <laughs> Frank Wells came in. And sat down and looked at what we said. That no, you guys aren't really doing this. this is a, you're, you're, you're faking this demo. It's not really happening. He said, "No, it, yes, it is." Okay, he said, "Okay, then take that picture of the, this uh, this mountain. Have Tinkerbell fly over that mountain." And we said, "Okay." And so with, within a couple of hours, we had a picture of Tinkerbell uh, flying over the mountain. And he he said. Gosh, you guys really did it. This is a real system. He was kind of shocked. <laughs> <laughs> he, he thought he had caught us, but he didn't. Right. He was. Yeah. And uh, Michael Eisner, when you met him, he always seemed kind of dumb and like he didn't know what was going on. But he's known to be an extremely sharp businessman. I have a feeling that that is kind of something he does to put people off. So when he has meetings with people. He kind of comes off as dumb. You think you can get away with something, and then he'll catch you at it. He, he uses it to kind of <laughs> – that's his, his kind of technique. I That's my theory. Right. So. <laughs> um, when you worked on Aladdin, you was a part of the carpet. Um, yes. I loved your design for the carpet. I thought it was a real cool character. It would have been uh, – Interesting if it, if it was a character who actually had a talking mouth, <laughs> but um, mm-hmm. yeah, that that was a cool design of what you did for that one. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, thanks. That was a that was kind of scary when I first got the assignment because I didn't know how he was going to do a carpet. I wasn't sure whether I wanted to take it, but uh, I saw some sketches at Gombers that had a story had done of the carpet and get, thought, oh yeah, yeah, you could do it, and so. Uh, it was uh, a fun challenge. Sometimes it was really hard to find the right poses, how to fold the carpet to get a pose that looked like something. Right. But uh, it, um, no, it was a, a lot of a lot of fun because I really, I really had a kind of a feeling for a personality that I wanted to put across. It's kind of an innocent little guy, uh, and the the whole opening sequence where you see him in the cave. Uh, it had originally been storyboarded for he came out like a dog, like panting and jumping around and stuff. And mm-hmm. I went to directors and said, uh, you know, I think he can get more out of this. He could actually be a character and not just be an animal that follows him around. I said, okay, I'll show me what you want to do. So I got a chance to I storyboarded that whole idea of him waking up and seeing the monkey and grabbing the hat and all that stuff was all, all my ideas to try to. Ex, you know, explain who this character is, and that's kind of where he got set up. So it was kind of fun to be able to storyboard and then animate after you'd storyboarded the stuff you'd done. You don't get a chance to do that that often. Right. Um, 
Do you think Aladdin would have had a different story appeal if they had did the original treatment with Howard's song, Proud of Your Boy? Um, I'm not sure. I, I never saw that version all the way through. I just saw little parts of it. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, I know it was based on Ron Clements. Ron Clements had a, a whole different take on it, much more of kind of a – it was not really as much of a romance as much as a please your mother kind of theme. Right. So that probably would not have gone over as well with a general audience. It might have gone over well with kids, but uh, I'm not really sure. I didn't never really saw the finished version of that. Okay. Um, you also worked on Lion King and Hercules. Yes. And, uh, yeah, Lion King, it was, uh, I just worked on Zazu. It was, it was kind of, kind of fun. It was, uh, I had no idea the movie was going to be as big as it was at the time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, y'all, y'all, just did, y'all just did Beauty and the Beast, and that was a hit and yeah. one Oscar nomination. Alan making one yeah. for his, his awards as well for the music, and then Aladdin, and then here came Lion King, and then ended up going to Broadway as well. <laughs> did you leave Disney? Because it showed that you had worked on Ants and Shrek at DreamWorks. Uh, yes, I did. Um, after Hercules, and at the time, DreamWorks was just starting up. And there were, uh, animation at Disney had been changing where they were getting these, uh, a lot of managers to manage things and they didn't seem to have any respect for the artists at the time. It, it was becoming completely, uh, management centric. They'd have come out charts and graphs and all this stuff on how to do everything. And DreamWorks was starting up and they were promising a very creative, atmosphere and so at the time I decided uh, I'll take a chance and try DreamWorks because Disney was not you know it looked like it was changing and it did for quite a while it did become very management centric and not artist artist centric and then it went back in later years but um right yeah so I went over there and um I first did a, se- a storyboard and a sequence for uh, Prince of Egypt which uh, Jeffrey really liked, and he showed it to, called Spielberg in, I pitched it for him, which was real exciting, and everybody loved it, but then Spielberg said, that eh, doesn't fit the tone of the movie, because it was a, more of a cartoony tone, which is what Jeffrey wanted at the time, right. and so they actually changed it all uh, but for the final movie, and uh, about a year later, Jeffrey came up to me and said that he apologized for having me do that sequence because he had asked for the wrong thing mm. and he said i had given given him exactly what he wanted but he had asked for the wrong thing so i thought was that was nice right and, yeah and then i went on ants uh, he gave me the opportunity to be the head of story on ants and moved up to san francisco for a couple of years to work on that and then shrek was in trouble so i came down had gone through several variations came down started to work on that and while I was working on it, it was still getting into trouble. At one meeting, after seeing a, a rough screening of it, Jeffrey was really depressed and said he was thinking about closing it down because it just wasn't coming together at all. Wow. And Yeah, and uh, it was basically a story of a, an ogre who wanted to become a knight. It was a very different thing. It didn't have the fairy tale theme at all in it. It was just kind of a traditional old, you know, story. Uh, and then I had the idea of what if we started like a regular Disney movie and then kind of twisted it. So I wrote up that whole opening of the, the story of the princess and then the, you know, tear the page out and said, ah, that's crap, you know, that stuff. That's right. where I, I, I wrote up all that and drew up storyboards for that. And Jeffrey really loved it. And that got people thinking, huh, it's like a Disney movie, but not but it's kind of not really a Disney movie. And he said, what if we had more fairy tale characters? And so then I had the whole story team go out and we brainstormed a whole bunch of ideas of different fairy tale characters, how they might interact with Shrek and what might happen. And that's where that whole fairy tale theme came from on Shrek. Right. So I got that into it. 
Jeremy said, that's it. That's falling together. That's that's the movie we need to make. So, yeah, it just yeah, kind of just, just happened. Yeah, I, I, I love Shrek. I remember when it first came out, I saw the movies. Um, and I saw that later after it came out on video um, at the time, because that came out the year A Bug's Life came out, I thought mm. Ants was actually a Bugs Life too, but in a different form for some reason. Yeah, um, yeah, it was. There was a competition there. Uh, actually, Ants was scheduled originally to come out after Bugs Life, and uh, then, uh, like the last few months, Jeffrey said, "Okay, we're going to speed up the production because we're going to come out before Bugs Life." And John Lasseter called up, was furious with Jeffrey because it was the last minute, just switching it that way. The producers actually didn't know either on Hence, and they had to really push up the schedule on everything to right. get it out on time. But they, they got it out before Bugs Life, but it never, it was, it, it a little creepy. <laughs> and so are the designs. Yeah. We, we had them, the designs I thought were awful of the characters. They were really kind of ugly, but they had, a, once again, a, a board of all kinds of ant designs from illustrators, cartoonists, all kinds of different ideas for ants. Uh, and uh, Jeffrey came in and went through all of them and finally said, ah, oh, this is the design we're going to go. And he picked the absolute, what I thought was the absolute worst design on the whole board. <laughs> and that's what he decided to go with for the ant characters. It's yeah. It's creepy. Anyway, that Jeffrey doesn't have the best artistic taste. He was very good at <laughs> he, he's very good at looking at story and finding problems, saying you have to work on this, you have to work on that. But he's terrible at coming up with the solutions for it. And that's he one does, of the that's one of the things people would always talk about with Jeffrey later on when they're making these movies that he was kind of the uh, not good enough, need more kind of a kind of a guy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So he got his own studio. He would you come up to tell you exactly how to do solve the problem, and his solutions were never <laughs> the best. So. Yeah, yeah. You also worked on um, kind of the last two D film for Disney, The Princess and the Frog. Yeah, yeah. It's Ron and John. Yeah, I actually didn't see that movie until maybe a few years later afterwards. Um, I think the last movie for Disney I saw was Atlantis, but I said, you know, I'm going to give it a shot and check it out. And it was a good movie. I like Princess and the Frog. Yeah, it had some really, really nice, fun stuff. Um, I had some issues with the story that I thought was never quite worked out. Because it, the story always seemed to be more about the prince, really, than the girl. He was the one with the biggest problem that needed to be solved, uh, but and, but the story was about the girl, and he never quite resolved it structurally wise the the, the story. Right. Facilier, his his problem was with the prince; it was not with the girl, and so he should have restructured it so that the girl was basically his problem. So they would be it would be more against her against him as opposed to Fazilia against the Prince. But anyway, it, it was entertaining. It was fun. It was fun to work on 2D animation for a change. Yeah. <laughs> um, I had a question that you can maybe ask, answer for me in a way. Um, mm -hmm. And what can see them do? There's a scene that shows, um, I guess as y'all talking about a lot, and the scene with you in it with Jeffrey and the animators, Ronnie John, and Roy mm -hmm. is there, and he's talking with you guys. Um, I was going to say, um, what exactly was, what, what conversation was going on in that scene in that moment with, with Jeffrey talking with you guys? Mm, actually, I don't, I don't remember. I, I, when I was looking at that in the film, I was trying to remember that moment. I don't remember what that was exactly. Okay. Uh, do you remember when it, something he said in there? Because um, um, I remember they said that um, there was a moment when Jeffrey was talking with the animators, like, what was it like working for Disney? And some people were saying they couldn't raise a family because of the, the hours. And then, oh, yeah. some, and, and then some of that scene, um, y'all was showing him pieces for making the lead and as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it, it might have been one of those meetings. I was in one of those meetings. I was in a small room around the table. Uh, but, yeah, there were... Yeah, several meetings where people were talking about how Jeffrey was pushing them too hard, uh, and 
you know, they didn't have any time for anything. And uh, Jeremy said, okay, we're going to work on that. And then, like he said, just pushed everybody harder. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what are, your, what are your current plans right now, Randy? Well, uh, right now I'm, I'm with uh, Disney TV working on the Mickey Mouse thing and supervising the storyboards. Um, and, you know, it's, it's kind of nice, kind of relaxing. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's, 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 uh, to, to do this, it's um, you know, a lot of a lot of work to do, but um, it's something you know pretty easy doing the, the cartoony type stuff. Right. These characters. So um, that's what I'm doing right now, and I don't really. I'm, I'm hoping for some some change in the future, but I don't know what exactly. You know, we'll just wait and see how what what crops up. Okay. So, uh, and. Uh, is there any plans to make a? Uh, I know your animation is your background, but is there any plans that maybe do a short with uh, live action? Um, I don't have any real ideas. Well, I actually have some from high school, <laughs> but um, no, I have no real plans on that. Because uh, actually, like I said, computer programming is still my hobby. I've been kind of a uh, trying to learn a little bit about the um, the uh, artificial intelligence uh, AI programming stuff. There's like some amazing things they can do with that. I'm trying to learn a little bit about that just to, to play with it. Yeah. And so you can kind of take a, a photo and make it look like a, a Monet painting or a Van Gogh painting and that type of thing. It's, it's kind of fun as a as a hobby to, to play around with yeah. <laughs> computer programming. Yeah. So... I I once said that if you were to if you guys were to make a like a movie like people would do now about um their life and everything I once said mm-hmm. that John Travolta could play you or um <laughs> 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 he he came to mind at, at the time they had made Wild Hogs and uh-huh. yeah I I thought of uh, him a lot of him and you a little bit um between him and um Sylvester Stallone a little bit. Oh well. <laughs> yes. Well, I hear Sylvester Stallone has uh, stopped dyeing his hair and it's all gray now, so now it matches. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. What advice would you give somebody trying to come into animation today? Well, uh, it it really depends on what you're going to do. There's so many areas you can things you can do now. You can be a you can you can do storyboards. You can do art design. You can do Animation, computer animation, uh, you can do video games. Uh, there are just so many different things, and it depends on what you're going to do. If you're going to be a storyboard artist or an uh, art designer, of course, uh, you know, polishing your art portfolio as much as you can. Uh, but now so many people need to know uh, computer, computer animation animators all over the world. There's computer animation being done. Uh, and for that, of course, you have to just find a good computer school that teaches that and, and learn, learn Maya and, and some of the, uh, computing programs. Of course, and everybody uses, um, of course, Photoshop. Le- learning the computer graphic programs is kind of essential almost anywhere. Right. Uh, Photoshop. We use, uh, Storyboard Pro here and, uh, some other Toon Boom programs. Uh, and um, I know the uh, school is very useful for you know just learning what what's available, having tools available, and learning all the basics of how to do things. Uh, like for, for me, I learned most of my animation ability before I actually got into Disney by from books and just learning and practicing and doing things myself. So I think. Actually, doing some animation is probably the best thing you can do uh, to learn. You just get your hands dirty. And now with computers, there's so much you can do at home. Uh, when I was uh, in school, there were no computers, and you know you had just to do a real hand-drawn animated picture, and then make cells, and paint the cells, and paint the backgrounds. It was a huge effort. That's why it took me five years to do my little film. Right. Um, now you can do so much on with all the computer programs available that, that take a lot of the tediousness out of it. So 
uh, I don't know, there's just so much stuff available, software, schools. I was just looking online, and they're like, things like the 50 best animation schools, you know, gosh, they said there were two animation schools when I started. Yeah. So, and, and they look like good lists, looking at them, all the schools that I, I know about and know people that have come from them. So that, those lists are, you know, useful. And, and like you say, uh, an actual degree is not important, really. Nobody looks at that. They look at what you've actually done. Right. You have to show samples of your work, samples of your drawing, if you're a computer animator, samples of your film. Uh, and um, that's what they will judge you on is what you can actually do for them. So, Okay. What is your favorite kind of music? Music? Oh, I like – oh, I'm very eclectic. I don't like popular music generally. Uh, I like – I like strange comic music. Uh, is, there's a, a guy from the 50s, I think, Jonathan Edwards, who plays piano. He, he's the worst piano player in the world, and I, I like that. Um, I like uh, I like Bulgarian and Yugoslavian uh, music. I used to do folk dancing a lot. You guys do a lot of. Uh, you know, Middle Eastern folk dance uh, music, so I like that kind of stuff. So I'm, I'm very eclectic. I'm not anything that anybody else would uh, would identify with. I'm afraid. <laughs> well, you know, it's cool. You know, everybody likes their own style of music. Uh, maybe one mm-hmm. day you can uh, start a, a singing group. You know? Yeah, yeah. Um, looking back at your career over the years, is there a a term to sum it up, I mean, did you know back then growing up that you would have this journey that you'd had? Well, I, no, it's, it's been very different than what I expected. Uh, though, I, like I said, I knew I was, I, I was determined to get into animation. If I had to do really poor TV animation, that's what I would do. I just had to get into animation somehow. Uh, but when I started at Disney, I, just, I thought I would be there at Disney the rest of my life just doing animation like uh, Frank and Ollie. Uh, you know, I expected I would be an old guy still at the drawing board sitting there sketching away. Didn't have any idea that drawn animation would just about disappear and uh, computer animation would take over and I don't know. It, and I never had any idea what <clears throat> my career would take me to, to Japan. Yeah. And that was completely... Uh, in fact, when Tokyo Disneyland first opened, I thought to myself, well, that's one Disneyland I'll never see. <laughs> and maybe a couple of years later, I got a chance to go to Tokyo Disneyland. So it never happens the way you expect. Right. And, and so whatever your career is, I'm sure your life will take many paths that uh, you had no idea that would be there for you someday. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, life... There's always, you know, obstacles here and there to your life and your time getting to where you need to be at, and even after you get to where you be at. Um, yep. But it, but it, but it helps it helps you grow at the same time. Yes, yeah, I I hate I hate I hate doing the same thing and being at the same place. Uh, like uh, to feel like you've gotten somewhere <clears throat> and now you're there is is an awful feeling. I always want somewhere I'm going to, not that I'm there. <laughs> okay. Um, and the last thing I was going to ask you, we talked about you working with a lot of people, and I had some people written that you had worked with. Just, just in a circle, you mm-hmm. like working with them. Glenn Keith. Well, Glenn, well, Glenn's a, he's a really nice guy. Yeah, a lot of energy. Uh, and, yeah, I worked with him on, on a lot of things. He's just, <clears throat> I don't know, just, and of course, one of the best artists in animation, his, he he started out fairly good, and then over the years got to be fantastic. He's he's one of the few uh, animators that you know is a real artist uh, and can put that into his animation. Will Finn? Uh, Will he was uh, uh, he, the the main thing I know him from was the when he worked on uh, Beauty and the Beast on the clock, but then also he was a co-director of. Um, the the well, Sinbad movie when I worked at DreamWorks. Oh, yeah. yeah. He's, a, 
he was a, a nice guy. I didn't really work directly with him uh, on anything, though. We were always on different projects. Uh, and, and in, in Beauty and the Beast, we were, uh, our characters never really interacted much together, so we didn't really have a chance to work together very much. Right. Did you uh, work with Peter Snyder? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Peter, Peter's the one that okayed me to go into the computer uh, thing. Uh, yeah, and he's a very intense uh, guy. <laughs> and he, yeah, he's, he, he's always been friendly to me. I hear he scares some people, some people he would really be tough on. But um, for me, I always got along fine with him. Okay. Um, not too long ago. Yeah. Howard Ashman and Alan Lincoln? Uh, I never really worked with them directly. I was, um, when they were working on uh, their movies, I was in the computer uh, area when they were really working on most of their stuff. So I never got a chance. I saw them around, but I never really got a chance to talk with them or work with them. Don Hahn? And Don Hahn. Don said that his first job was in between one of my uh, Fox and Hound scenes. <laughs> Not only all these people who started with me. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, Don's a, Don's a really great guy. He, he's he's really good with people, really good at uh, talking and presentations, and he's a, he's a pretty good artist himself, too. Yeah. We talked about him a bit here. Um, Jeffrey Katzenberg? Yeah, and Jeffrey, um, uh, like I said, he, he's also a pretty intimidating guy. He's very short, but he's intimidating. <laughs> and, um, yeah. Did you have any intake of how the studio would be when he left in '94? Uh, yeah, it was. It, it scared uh, Ron and John a lot. Uh, we were working on Hercules, and oh. um, yeah, when when he left, right in the middle of Hercules, and the, uh, the thing was, Jeffrey was hard to work with, but he would he would push everybody, which people didn't like, but it would make it would people would do better work than they would do otherwise because they were pushed. And I think Ron and John kind of realized that. They would often complain about how much he's pushing them and changing their material, but it became better when he would do that and they kinda of realized that. So when he when we heard uh Jeffrey was leaving actually I, I was I heard before John and went into John's room and said, Uh oh, I hear Jeffrey's leaving and John was just like in shock. Yeah. Um, really depended on him to kind of, you know, step in and have a third eye on all these all the, these story ideas. So yeah, I, I know at the time um, he he was a big influence on the company. Um, he really helped as far as shaping the company up. And I know that uh, when he left, uh, they were saying that he wanted to take Frank's job when Frank passed, but Michael and Roy didn't really want that, and he ended up yeah. doing dream works afterwards. Yep, and uh, and I think Pocahontas really suffered, I think, because it was, did not... Pocahontas, I didn't think, was a very good story, and I think Jeffrey would have pushed... If Jeffrey had been a main during the whole production, he would have kept pushing it and pushing it and made a better story out of it. Right. Like, kill everybody to find it. <laughs> he would kill everybody to make, you know, get everybody to kill themselves to do it. Uh, but when he left, the the story in the state it was in, it kind of became the same. He just kind of finished off the movie in the state it was when he left, and it was not really finished, a finished story. Right. I don't know much about this gentleman here, but he was in Wake Up and Beauty and was a part of the mm -hmm. Boxing and Hound and Black Cauldron, um, Rick Rich. Oh, Rick Rich. Yeah, he was... Um, he was an assistant director, I think, to Woolley, uh, and then became a director on uh, Fox and Hound, uh, but he was never an artist, uh, which was the thing. He was more of a guy that kind of a ambitious, and he was oh, Don Bluth's assistant for a while, and um, yeah, we didn't think he was really the right guy to be one of the directors on Fox and Hound. He was not, like you say, he didn't. He's not really an artist. He's no draw or animation. George Scribner? Scribner. Uh, Scribner I, I didn't really work with. Except what I did animated one scene on Oliver and Company with him. Uh, but uh, that was all uh, on that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Scribner's a, a nice guy. And, uh, you know, goes along fine. 
Uh, oh, you didn't ask about Tim Burton. Tim. <laughs> I, I, I was getting <laughs> Yeah, I, yeah. I was yeah, getting about Tim Burton because I, I didn't know he had worked with y'all early on. I know I know the night yeah. before Christmas, but I didn't know he had worked with y'all early on. Yeah, he was he was there, uh, and um, yeah, well, Tim Tim was a, a great guy. He's a, still kind of a friend. He invited me to some of his uh, art shows, um, but he, he's gotten so big now. It's just we never dreamed that he would become this big multimillionaire. We always yeah. knew he was unique and expecting to break off and do like small independent films in his own quirky style. Uh, is what we expected. The fact he became a major Hollywood for us was was kind of a shock. Right. <laughs> uh, you know, there's um, we made a home movie uh called Luau. Have you heard about that at all? No. It was, uh, okay, Tim and Jerry Reese started a home movie, uh, and they were looking for. Uh, I had my new camera. And so I said, hey, I got my camera, sound camera, I can film it. So, okay. So I became the cameraman because I owned the camera. Right. And uh, um, it was done with all the animation department, uh, a little movie that they wrote, a strange, kind of a bizarre little movie with some Tim Burton touches. Uh, based on kind of an old um, Annette Pimicello beach movie combined with the search for Bigfoot. Right. Uh, like, <laughs> so, um it's, it's online somewhere. If you look for Tim Burton Luau, you can probably find it. I think it's on YouTube. Okay. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll, I'll yeah. answer that. Yeah. Anything about working with Ron Clemens and uh, John Musker? Yeah, well, they've been good. Ron was one of my best friends when we first started. There were four of us that hung up together all the time. Me, Tad Stones, Ron Clemens, and Ed Gombert. We were kind of... Uh, one of the artists did a picture of us as uh, paper cutouts all stuck together because we walked around together all the time. <laughs> yeah, Ron was a, a really good friend. And then John also was a good friend. John and I would sometimes in our early years go out to Cal Arts and just kind of give little uh, impromptu talks to the animators out there. We did that a few times. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah, so they, they've been good friends ever since uh, they started, so. Yeah, I, I know. I know. Um, you mentioned you just mentioned him. I know him uh, a little bit from his work on Aladdin. Um, Ed Ed Gomberg. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Ed Ed uh, Ed is a good friend. Except he's become a curmudgeon and kind of doesn't talk to anybody anymore. So. Oh, <laughs> he's he's always been a curmudgeon, but as he got older, he became a real one. So, anyways. Okay, Mike Mike Giamo and Mike Gabriel. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, Mike Gabriel's always been a really good artist. Uh, and Giamo, too. Giamo, yeah, he, they've done a lot of, a lot of great stuff. Those are, yeah, they're some of the, the Cal Arts team, part of the, uh, the Rat's Nest. Right. Which is the, the room that Don Bluth, all, all the Cal Arts people Don Bluth hated were in the Rat's Nest. <laughs> so, uh, oh. yeah, no, they're both really, really nice. I mean, yeah. Anything about Roy D. Disney? And Roy, I, I do him a little bit. Uh, he he always seemed very friendly and easygoing. I hear he could be hard nosed in, in meetings, but I never experienced it. Never worked with him directly on any productions, though. I'm sure growing up, you know, who, like we talked about earlier, who knew that you know your life would change? And you, mm -hmm. I really thank you for your contribution to all these movies. Your your touch on mm -hmm. all of them, um, they wouldn't have been the same without you. you mm -hmm. know, they, I, I had an interview with uh, Dave Prusma mm -hmm. and George Scribner, and I, re I told them the same thing I tell you. I really mm -hmm. wish that they would give you guys some kind of an an award for all your hard work, like mm -hmm. a, like an Oscar or. Golden Globe, like something mm -hmm. for y'all hard work. Y'all, y'all like the unsung legends of Disney, you know. Well, thank you very much. That's, that's nice. I, I do have several little one-year Mickey Mouse pins. <laughs> I'll give you up to yours for one year. <laughs> yeah, but I, I, I'm right. really, really thankful for it, and, and thank you for being part of my podcast and coming on board, yeah. talking. Um, it was good talking with you about your time at Disney and. Um, Folks, we'll be back in just a moment after this commercial break. My baby wrote me a dear John letter. She's gone and vanished. She says it's better. Hi, Clem. Oh, Linda.
Linda, I thought you'd vanished. I did, with Vanish Drop-In, the easy bowl cleaner. I can't brush every day, so I drop in the Vanish Drop-In to help keep me clean and fresh between brushings. Prettiest porcelain I ever seen. Wanna vanish together? Oh, I love it when you talk clean. Vanish Drop-In, clean and simple. Well, YouTubers, it's been a lot of fun. Thank you for tuning in this week for P.E. Slick Podcast. I'm your host, Ranger Matt, signing off. Until next time, you have a good night now. See ya.